I really like this line of research, but... So, Sebastian, you know, we talked about this. One of the issues, I think, that is... So we have folks here who are trying to think of what to do in clinics and communities, and we provide tools, and these are potential tools, but um, I think there's a question here. It's atheoretical. So is it possible that the people who did better were more adherent, or the teachers who got their bonuses early felt appreciated and rewarded? And it's not about behavioral economics, it's about something else. We have a different name for it, but is it possible that you could appreciate and reward without giving money or a lottery? Thanks, Chris, for this question. I, I think there, there, there are three questions that I get uh, when I present uh, behavioral economics to an audience who hasn't really been exposed to it very much, are typically, on the one hand, don't you trick people by you know, doing, for example, opt-in versus opt-out, which is one component of behavioral economics that actually does not rely on rewards. So that partially answers, hopefully, also your first question. And I would say no, because in a lot of uh, situations, you have to make a decision. To, on, on a form, you have to ask the question, do you want to be tested or not? So in one way or the other, you have to make a decision to ask that question. So I think we're not tricking people. And all the interventions that we're doing obviously go through IRB reviews. So I'm not too worried about the ethics part of it. The second part is, it, is it a magical bullet or is it a, a fad? And I think. Um, because people are surprised that it hasn't been used in HIV yet. But there's a, almost now a decade of empirical evidence that the, a lot of these things work in situations that are very, very similar to HIV, over, being overweight, uh, smoking, and so on. And the third one is that it's really not about the money, as I tried to stress in my, in my presentation. It's really about thinking about the mechanisms through which things work. And I disagree that it's um, atheoretical. For example, the uh, prospect theory of, Dunneman, of Kahneman and Traversky. Actually, that, that's one of the benefits that we economists bring to the table by using psychology insight is that we're actually trying to measure and quantify things. For example, uh, that gains empirically are found to hurt twice as much as, uh, sorry, losses are found twice to hurt twice as much as gains. So. I think economists actually go a, a step beyond it. They actually measure things and put it in a theoretical context and try to uh, arrive at a unified theory where, where these behaviors are measured. So I, I'm not sure what you mean with a theoretical. I appreciate that behavioral economics is broader than simply money and, and incentives. But isn't a lottery a variable reinforcement schedule? Yes. Um, but I, I think and what I tried to say is that A, Behavioral economics is not necessarily, does not reinvent the wheel. We are standing on the shoulders of giants of people who use contingency management or variable reward schedules. But I think we also think a lot about situational factors. So I tried to, loss aversion, for example, is something that in, in psychology frameworks is typically not used. The overvaluing and overoptimism is typically not found. And another example, just very concretely, um, these. Um, commitment devices where people put money up front. I think that's something that really is very behavioral econy because people are typically happy to be helped to do what they want to do anyway and people realize that they're not good at it. So in an intervention where we would use something like the bonus giving at the front, we would tell people we know that you want to do well and we also know that you probably will fail. So put the money on the table and we'll see who's right. So I think that's a, a twist that's minor, but it had, has really large impact, and that differentiates us from contingency management. I think just one more thing in addition, when talking about the teacher bonuses study, the, um, if you, uh, you're maybe saying that they just felt more appreciated, but the, the teachers in both arms both knew that they were going to get the bonus. It wasn't like a surprise you get a bonus at the end of the year versus surprise you get a bonus at the, at the beginning of the year. And in fact, when they interviewed the teachers, the teachers themselves thought we all would do the same. Um, they also measured how much time they thought, oh, maybe they're the teachers who have the money in the beginning spent more time with the students or something like that. They measured that it didn't um, occur. So. Um, you know, it, although 
it, we had, it's not a perfect answer. You know, the monetary rewards were the same. So although they um, may not, they should feel a, about the same amount of appreciated. And the real thing that they really tried to vary was just whether it was a gain or a loss. Yeah, I mean, I mean there have been a couple of studies that used that sort of uh, loss framing. Uh, another one was with actual school kids who, who got, uh, who were told if you, and that's, that's a time frame of within an hour, so it, it relates a little, it hopefully weakens the argument that it's just about something at the beginning and at the end. Um, they were told if you improve your SAT score by X percent, you'll get $100, and other people got $100 up front, put it in an envelope, wrote down, with these $100, I'm going to go to the movies or take my girlfriend out for dinner. Um, and just this uh, linking um, the, the, the effort to this um, gain at the beginning or the loss at the end really helped a lot. So, so I'm not sure if one would feel more appreciated than the other. I mean, you could also make the argument that those people feel that, well, there's a lot of <laughs> counter arguments. Following up on um, Chris's question, maybe another, I, I want to follow up on this issue of this variable reinforcement schedule because to my mind, every time people go to Las Vegas and stuff, they, they come back happy whether they've won or lost. They, they get a reward from it if they lost money at the tables. Well, they still got free drinks. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, may, maybe, you know, the, for the losing lottery people, maybe if you just offer a soft drink, they'll all, all come away with something and then they, something like that is part of the uh, intervention program. <laughs> I don't know what you, what you think about that, 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 like we were talking about the reward being intrinsic, that there's something about playing the game, even if they lose, that they're winners somehow. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. I think the, the more general point is that um, these, these examples all sound very intuitive and fun and simple, but I think uh, it does not take away that there's a, a theoretical underpinning to these that we didn't present here. On the other hand, that behaviors are really, really difficult and that you have to take the context into account. So for example, in Uganda, it's really, really hard, would be really, really hard to work with really rigid loss frames because people get demotivated very, very quickly. So in my um, lottery, it has been going on for about 10 months now, people are starting to say, oh, I haven't won anything in six months and I'm giving up. So I've started offering kind of very small prizes. So the I think the interventions are intuitive, but it doesn't take away that you really have to adapt them very, very carefully. And we're doing extensive formative phases to, to make sure that the, it's appropriate to the local context. Uh, thank you. It was a very thought-provoking thought presentation. Uh, I'm not really sure how to frame this, but on one hand, in the community, we've, uh, we've found that fear-based approaches really don't seem to motivate people for prevention. And so I'm wondering how uh, the behavioral economic model can inform prevention efforts. Yeah, I'll take that. So um, uh, one of our collaborators, Ian Holloway, couldn't be here today, but I was just talking to him last week about um, a study that he's thinking about doing involving behavioral economics and prevention um, in terms of networks. And so one of the things we were talking about is um, capturing the uh, you know, the advantage of the networks, really reaching out, like Amy was talking about, really getting people um, in contact and sort of in the prevention frame. and. The idea, the behavioral economic idea, would be you know leveraging those relationships. Um, they're going to provide incentives, and they're going to provide incentives. Uh, hopefully, I'm not revealing his. Uh, <laughs> no one else do this study. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but we're probably going to do incentives for the dyad, right? So it's um, a. a something that you win, but it's for you and the other person in your network. So it's something fun to do, but it's also tying them together, yoking the outcomes together. So, you know, you only get the prize if the person that you're referring actually goes and shows up to get tested or, you know, something like that. So that's sort of the direction that we're going, that kind of intervention. So not so much just here's an incentive, you know, but really thinking about, you know, how do we leverage you know people's communication with each other um, we know that I think also behavioral economics yes we're math nerds we're just putting that out there we're math nerds but um, 
I think that we take a really agnostic view to people and problems and realize that everyone have these, has these same biases and heuristics. So it's actually really nice to apply it to groups that are normally stigmatized because we just see numbers because we're math nerds. But um, that's just one example of one way that we're trying to get beyond just here's a prize you know, or here's a picture of a meth mouth, You're, this is going to happen to you kind of fear-based tactics. So Ian does a lot of work on social networks. And so it's, you know, you're referring someone in your social network and if they get screened and remain um, HIV free, then you do also, you both get rewards. Your benefits are linked together to your, um, your benefits are linked to each other's outcomes. And also it's really, um, really trying to put some emphasis on the, the support network. So really leveraging that as well, because we know that's so important, you know, if you, if people in your network are, um, you know, responsible about testing and being clean, you're just more likely to do it as well. So it's sort of trying to emphasize that positive behavior or give a little bit of um, bump in that area. And, and I think uh, for prevention, even more so than for adherence, the name of the game is finding what drives people, their intrinsic motivation and making use of that. Because most studies that use, you know, very pure extrinsic motivation in terms of monetary rewards, things work for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, but I doubt that they will work for 30 years. So I think that's where we really have to challenge, you know, find what drives people, the intrinsic motivation, then incentivizing that with money or without money, depending on the context. So um, let me ask about our potential um, contrasting theory. So actually in the, in the late 80s, if you look at adolescents, adolescents are more optimistic, more myopic, um, every one of the characteristics that you've described. And the, the cognitive behavioral intervention strategies that have been used for a, lot of, a long time, in the 80s it was called anticipatory awareness. And so that people are overconfident, you want to make them more realistic. But rather than it being based on prosper theory, or behavioral economics, it, I would, it could be an alternative hypothesis is what you're doing is you're bringing their thoughts, their feelings, and their actions together. And that the more you can integrate that chain into a habit of how they feel being consistent. And a lot of what you said, I think is consistent with that integration. Like you wanna make fun interventions because you're raising affect tied to doing a healthy behavior and you're linking that positive affect with the healthy behavior. So how, what do you think? Does it ha is it really on the basis of a potential gain, perceived gain, whether it's myopia or overconfidence, or could it be a better integration of the habits of what you feel, think, and do? Um, so I'm not aware of this theory, so thanks for pointing it out. Um, and. And again, I would like to stress that we're standing on the shoulders of giants, and I'm not sure we have to reinvent everything. For me, behavioral economics uh, is a little bit like what Steve Jobs did. He did not invent the computer, but he refined it to an extent that really somehow made minor changes that really made my 93-year-old grandfather use it every week now to Skype with me. So I think uh, behavioral economics is not not everything is new, but I think we've thought about some things very, very carefully of what drives people and tried to, you know, combine psychology and the economics knowledge about incentives and the importance of incentives uh, to really combine it to make something very, very potent, as we've seen in other fields, not yet HIV. That's my answer. Um, so I think that that's a perfect answer. Wonderful. Um, but I think that we've talked about this a little bit, but I think... Um, I don't think that the things that we're talking about are inconsistent with what you're saying, we're doing. And I do come from the background of psychology, so I'm very aware of how much overlap there is between the different ideas. But I think that one thing that economics does kind of bring to the table is the idea of looking at behaviors that one individual can display all these types of behaviors. So when I was in sort of a psychology, putting my psychology hat on, I sort of thought, people who did this behavior or people who do this behavior are different in some way. And economics really looks at it in a way that everyone can perform any of these behaviors given the right context. So it's sort of a different way to look at things. And um, it's just sort of a new, fresh way, I think, to tackle the problems, which we all want to solve.
So I would think that if you're, you're thinking about people who are from a, a group of high prevalence or they engage in risky behaviors on an ongoing basis, you can think of HIV as both a, on the treatment side and prevention side as a chronic disease. So are there any longitudinal studies looking at the application of behavioral economics or different forms of incentives, incentives and, and motivational strategies that are maintained over time? Um, or do you have to you know, change up the incentive structure so that it, it's re, like ongoingly intriguing to the person, or is the goal that there would be you know the awareness of the intrinsic reward, and so that therefore the incentive, the external incentive, the extrinsic incentive can go away? Um, so currently, there there are no such studies in HIV. I'm not so sure about other health behaviors. I um, doubt so that yes, that right. you've hit the nail on the head on some of the the difficult problems with which people who have researched CM for a long time, continuity management, have had that same problem. Once you take away the incentives, the behavior goes away, and I think you see sort of the same thing no matter how you um, design the incentives. But there are some other interventions that have been done that much have much more long-lasting effects that I think are more structural interventions rather than incentive-based, but something like opt-in, opt-out testing, right? So, or sorry, not testing, I mean opt-in, opt-out programs. So in organ donation in Europe, um, they, some countries in Europe do an opt-in for organ donation and some do an opt-out. So you either elect, like in America, to be an organ donor or opt-out. You're an assumed organ donor and you need to elect to opt-out. And in the countries that are opt-in, they have an uptake rate of like 14%, like we have in uh, the US. But in the opt-out countries, they have like over 95% uptake. So those are structural sort of interventions. Now, there's all sorts of other problems with interventions like that, but they're definitely ones that show a lasting effect as long as that intervention is in place. Um, but it's not one where it's a continuous exchange of goods. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that necessarily one um, intervention should, and that relates back to this magic bullet uh, question, I don't think that one intervention needs to work for 30 years. I don't think that my lottery intervention would work for 30 years. I'm happy if it works for a year or two and it targets people who just kind of have fallen off the bandwagon and hopefully somehow brings them back. And I think that it relates to a more general problem that I think we think very often in terms of funding cycles of two or three years of, uh, in terms of the interventions that we do. But I think we really have to switch to think about the HIV life cycle of treatment initiation, maintenance, fatigue. Um, and I think, for example, in the initiation, just you know, use contingency management pay people, make sure they go and are linked to the clinic. But once in a clinic, you know, it becomes really important to build up their intrinsic motivation. And then, you know, maybe, um, and not everything has to be behavioral economics. I think uh, if people become demotivated, use um, what's it called? motivational interviewing. And then if people, maybe it's necessary to have a little lottery and bring a little fun in. And I, I think it has to be a multitude of things that really takes into account this life cycle that people definitely exhibit and I think it has to be a mix of different interventions and a mix of different disciplines to target different mechanisms of that drive people really I think that really goes along with the theme with like finding people where they are right when people are ready for an intervention it's really different impact than when they're not other questions um, I should say that uh, there's a UCLA researcher who has did some work with the opt-out for HIV testing in LA County and found um, it had a huge impact on the number of tests that were being done. So unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here today, but there is some work that's been done st for structural interventions in, in this area. So I'd like to thank our presenters. Um, they did a wonderful job.